esteemed head of the Mickey Mouse department. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> Um, in, in true uh, uh, aeronautical fashion, I will uh, uh, throw some <laughs> um, I'll throw some uh, some colourful powerpoints at you uh, to recap very very briefly on uh, the broad axis of our strategy, but a little bit more uh, precisely and deeper on uh, what we call our diversification strategy towards services and, uh, and air traffic management or air traffic control matters in particular. That'll be fairly quick. Uh, I think we've got an hour so we have some time for Q&A afterwards. Um, first of all, uh, Tom yesterday mentioned that our strategy or the, the broad direction of the company is organized and yes, it is organized. Uh, along four main axes, uh, engagement of people, Thierry Barril will talk about that, that uh, fundamental topic a little bit later, integration of the company, which is more of an introverted exercise of course, internationalization, I'll touch on that briefly, and innovation, these are the innovation days after all, and innovation, and this is really the, the point I'd like to drive home this morning, innovation is not just limited to the technology that goes into airplanes, it is also encompassing the diversification and evolution of the business model of uh, a uh, large aircraft OEM such as us. But it still remains very much focused on products. So very briefly, on the products, you've heard about it yesterday from John, from Tom, uh, you'll hear later about A350, but from the strategist I would summarize it as follows. We have a very comprehensive product portfolio, and why do we think we're in a strong strategic position? Why? Because we do have the largest aircraft in the world, serving therefore the largest hubs in the world. It's a good position to be in, having the largest aircraft in the world, when we all know that mathematically it is obvious that the size of aircraft grows. So when you have the largest aircraft in the world, you're pretty well positioned. You also know that the mega cities of the world, there are about uh, uh, 30 of them today, They're moving to 40 mega cities in our terminology are cities that have more than 10,000 international passengers traveling every day. You see that those mega cities are going to more than double around the world in the next 20 years. We'll have about 90 such mega cities in 20 years, and therefore having the largest aircraft in the world is a strong position to be in. A350, I won't steal a, a Didier's thunder. We have the world's most efficient twin aisle long range aircraft in the making, the A350, also a good position to be in. The A330 remains the, the unchallenged, there isn't a better aircraft out there, the unchallenged medium range, medium to long range, uh, wide body aircraft around, and on the A320, the NEO has proven that we hold on to our leadership position in the single aisle um, sector. So, from a product perspective, from the traditional airplane perspective, Airbus, the, strategy, the strategist will tell you, is extremely well positioned. I threw in uh, an, an extra uh, chart uh, uh, at the last minute here because last night at dinner there were a lot. There was a lot of discussion at the tables where I was sitting about yeah the neo strategy. There was some confusion about comments that had been made. Let me tell you my perspective for why we have made this neo decision. And the neo decision was driven from a strategic point of view somewhat by the emergence of new competitors. I don't want to overestimate that emergence of new competitors, but I don't want to be complacent about it either. We used to be, we still are, in a relatively stable duopoly, but we are going to compete going forward with people who don't compete along the same rules or with the same rules that we're used to competing with. We're going to compete with sovereign states the sovereign state of China, we're going to compete with the sovereign state of the Soviet, of the Soviet Union, Russia, we're going to <laughs> compete with the, uh, with the sovereign state of Japan. All of these airplane programs, uh, would be it the C919, be it the MS21 out of Russia, be it the 
uh, Mitsubishi Regional Jet, which arguably is in a, in a, in a niche uh, somewhat below our 150-seater segment, uh, all of these guys are nationally funded programs, 100% funded by very deep pockets indeed. So we need to anticipate. And the way we've anticipated is, frankly, not so much the NEO. What we've done with the NEO is we have put the A320, and Boeing has finally seen the light with the MAX, we've put the, the established air plans that are known and liked and appreciated by all the customers around the world at the highest technological standard, meaning with the new engines, so that for the next 10 or 15 years, we know there will be no new players in this industry because everybody has declared themselves. And, and that is really fundamentally the, 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 the strategic rationale for doing a NEO. I'll add one more thing. These new, these new players that are coming into the industry, it's legitimate. The world is, uh, air transportation is growing, so it's legitimate that there are new players who, who uh, want to offer aircraft. But they've made one mistake, if I dare say, one major mistake. None of these new players are bringing anything new to the party. All these new airplanes you see symbolized by these uh, flags up here are but imitations of A320s or 737s for that matter. There is nothing really new. And that has given us the opportunity by bringing in the new engines, which is really the only thing fundamentally new that the market is offering, putting them on the A320 and establishing a status quo situation for the next 10, 15 years or so. By doing that, as you know, we spent roughly 1 billion, in fact, we spent less than 1 billion on, on developing the NEO, as opposed to new airplane programs, which cost roughly 10 billion. The math is simple, we've saved 9 billion, and with that 9 billion, we can pay for all sorts of other things, and in particular, the innovation that is going to set us apart afterwards. And that innovation will come out before any of the new players have matured and brought their aircraft to a level where they're actually capable of penetrating the established market presence of the A320. And I'll accept the 737 as well. So you see the real strategy is one of differentiation and innovation and the NEO decision is helping us fund exactly that strategy. That's why I'm standing here, perhaps somewhat self-satisfied or, or complacent, and I'm saying that from a product perspective, in particular in the market segment where we are the leader, the single arm market segment, we are in a very strong position. Enough on products. Uh, you've heard plenty of stuff on products. So our strategy of innovation takes us beyond the products. Before I leave the, uh, the product itself, as I said, a lot of R&D goes into uh, researching the, the differentiating technologies for the post-NEO. That's the sort of inner circle you see on this, uh, on this graphic representation here. There are a number of rupture technologies that we're looking at that we are effectively uh, attempting to develop to create the rupture needed to maintain our leadership. Uh, you can see some of these uh, examples here. Not surprisingly, airplanes continue to be driven by engines and we have a lot of effort invested in new engine technologies, including um, the uh, open rotor technology that uh, our uh, uh, engineering community uh, is researching very actively because there, is, there just is not another form of propulsion that is as fuel efficient as propellers, I hate to tell you. So, uh, since we're continuing to have to pursue an obsession with fuel burn, fuel burn remains by far the largest cost chapter of our customers. We will continue to explore these rather radical uh, forms of propulsion, including open rotor. You see some of the other stuff, the sharklets, of course, you see biofuels, alternative fuels generally um, as, uh, as being a research. Uh, item uh, which carries with it 
uh, a strong connotation of, uh, uh, let me say, social responsibility, uh, responsibility or environmental responsibility. There's also a controversial uh, thing here about innovative cockpit. Yes, the second cost chapter of our customers is after fuel, arguably well after fuel or much smaller than fuel, is labor. So if we can reduce the labor involved in operating an aircraft, our customers uh, will follow us in, in that direction as well. So that's the inner circle. A lot of research going in and around the aircraft and the fundamental technologies that will drive the efficiency of the flying machine. Yesterday, Didier Lutz, our head of uh, support and services, customer services division, has uh, talked to you in, in, in significant detail about what I call the, se the sort of second um, orbit around the aircraft, which are the, the services associated with <coughs> operating the aircraft directly, with upgrading the airplane, the FHS, the flight hour support, or, or total care packages that we're, that we're orchestrating, um, uh, as well as operational support, uh, data support, training obviously, those are the kind of services that you would expect Airbus to develop organically out of the resources we have by definition because we need to support our customers. And, and Didier has made significant progress in, in exploiting these type of services. Um, I want to add to that, by the way, that um, the opportunity to develop these services arises quite naturally with the fleet size growing, the, the, the operated fleet size of Airbus is growing around the world. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, some of, some of you remarked yesterday, well, Boeing has done this a few years ago. Yeah, and rightly so, I, I'll say. Boeing, Boeing was right doing that, and we find exactly the same thing. We're doing the same thing. Why? Because our fleet size now, our installed fleet size, the number of aircraft operated around the world, allows us the critical mass to be able to drive a good return on uh, these kind of services. What I'd like to focus on a little bit here for a few minutes is the outer orbit. And, and this is where we're going into uncharted territory, I dare say, for a, a traditional aircraft manufacturer. Uh, uncharted territory. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in the more modest sense might be what I represent up here on the upper left corner as material management. Uh, you know we've made a, an acquisition, I think Didier talked about it yesterday, we've made a, a significant acquisition uh, with uh, Sater, where we, uh, we effectively bought a business that distributes spare parts for aircraft. So that, that is moving into an area where we traditionally were not present other than distributing our the big Airbus so-called proprietary parts, structural parts, and now we're capable of distributing all sorts of parts needed by airlines, not just the ones made by Airbus. So that was a venture into new territory for us. But maybe more importantly, some of the services that, let me say, are of the digital generation of services. And, and that's really where we're going to uncharted territory whether it's in airport operations, you see that on the upper right hand corner here, whether it's connectivity, which is a generic term that, uh, uh, that says that we're trying to get the passenger while he flies connected to the ground, uh, GSM or even Wi-Fi access to internet, that is a business we have moved in and that is finally taking off, I dare say, uh, and uh, an ATM that I'll, uh, I'll uh, describe in a little more detail here going forward. We have installed at Airbus a few years ago an incubator or a, we call it a business nursery uh, in our area of business development which is a, an attempt to exploit the myriad of brilliant ideas that come out of the 15,000 engineers that we employ but also other, th other ideas, business ideas, uh, uh, new venture ideas. We're incubating those, we're testing those, we're seeking partners to develop uh, these ideas into businesses, and I'll show you a couple of examples of, um, of such applications on which we have a lot of effort uh, going on and a lot of hope uh, invested. So, one of those, one of those new ideas um, that, that represent commercial opportunities is what we call ROPS. Now, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit esoteric here, Bear with me. ROPS stands for Runway Overrun Prevention System. 
It is a system developed by some of our brilliant engineers that allows that it's, it's a real-time information to the pilot as he's on short and final approach towards the runway, advising him whether or not he has enough runway to, uh, to safely land and under what configuration he should land, whether he should apply maximum reverse or maximum braking or he can, uh, he can uh, uh, not stress the airplane uh, and has plenty of runway. Uh, to go along. It's, a, it's an interactive system, real-time. It, it sounds pretty obvious, you might be amazed that this isn't already uh, standard on airplanes. Well, as a matter of fact, it is standard on, uh, on Airbus airplanes going forward. It's actually going to be uh, standard on the A350. 80% of the A380s that are flying today have adopted that system. Um, you might say, well, why, why are you telling me that, Christian? I'm telling you that because Runway excursions, airplanes leaving the runway, in fact, mostly on landing or exceeding the runway length, is by far, by far, the industry's biggest cost item when it comes to accidents. I forget the numbers, but there are, there are, there are huge, it's, I mean, it's in the billions of dollars of, of accumulated hull losses, even, that are um, occurring because airplanes leave the runway. And, uh, and not surprisingly, out of this, this technology that, that we've developed, we can develop an option for airlines to install the system on the airplane and, believe it or not, negotiate with their insurance provider a diminished insurance premium, and therein lies the business model of this particular application. The insurance community has applauded, it has offered airlines uh, discounts on the insurance rate if the airlines install the system on their airplanes. Now we've taken another, another somewhat uh, iconoclastic, I'd say, uh, move, uh, uh, having developed this system. We've actually opened the system up to all the other aircraft manufacturers. We don't mess with airplane safety. We have a very good system here. The authorities absolutely love it. It corresponds to the guidelines issued by the FAA years ago. We're the first to market with this. We've offered it, made it available to other aircraft manufacturers, and I dare say we're in discussions with the other aircraft manufacturers uh, to uh, develop applications of the system on non-Airbus airplanes as well. That is one example of the kind of diversification the company pursues. Here's another one, dubbed Elise. Elise is a, it's a consulting activity that consists in measuring, I'll keep it simple, if it's too complicated, I'm lost anyway, but uh, it's a system that, that, that allows us to measure the interferences, electromagnetic or other interferences, on the ILS system as you approach uh, uh, an airport or, or a runway. Why is this important? It's important because there are certain guidelines today when you approach a runway you, you can't have big buildings, you can't do parallel landings if you have another runway right next to it because the legislator says, the regulator says, you've got to keep all these interfering structures, whether it's other airplanes or buildings or, or, or trains or what have you, you've got to keep them at a safe distance from your, your landing guidance system. With, with the technology we have here, we can actually measure and evaluate the interferences, the theoretical interferences, if you were to put a building closer to the runway, if you had another parallel runway with airplanes taking off or landing, you can measure it, you can almost calibrate the system to correct for the interferences, and thus, with the measurement that we are able to, to calculate, you can put more buildings, you can densify effectively the use of your airport, either by adding real estate or by adding more traffic or by having airplanes take off in parallel and thus augmenting the productivity of the airport. Sorry if this sounds rather esoteric, but we're getting great response in the market uh, already. We've got a few airports, uh, uh, Vienna comes to mind, Warsaw, etc., that are quite interested and, and that have signed pre-agreements with us to, uh, to uh, invite us to do this consulting so that they can densify <coughs> the operation of their airport. Here's another one, taxi boat. Uh, we've already communicated on this uh, to some extent. This is a, a uh, doesn't look like much, but it's, it's, it's pretty complex. 
This is a, a development where we're currently doing with uh, our colleagues from uh, Israel Aircraft Industries. It is the development of a robotized, hence taxi bot, of a robotized way to taxi airplanes without the engines running. It's about, on average, people can argue about it, but let's say the order of magnitude, an airplane burns about 4% of its total fuel while it's taxiing on the ground, uh, uh, waiting, etc., etc. The airlines are telling us, please find a way to reduce the fuel burn of the airplanes while it's operating on the ground. Tractors are nothing new. You know, we're we using tractors for pushback to pull airplanes out of the ramp space onto the taxiway, etc. What's new here is that with this technology, you don't, you, you, you don't necessarily need a driver in the taxi. Ultimately, the objective of this, uh, of this robotized taxi is that the pilot in the airplane actually controls the operation of the tractor through a fairly complex mechanism that the driver, uh, the, uh, the driver, the pilot, the pilot of the airplane actually controls the tractor with, uh, with his, uh, his, uh, his steering wheel, if you like, and, uh, and with his uh, brake pedals. Um, so uh, through, uh, through gyro mechanisms he can send the impulse to the, to the robotized uh, uh, tractor. So, not just uh, are we saving, in the first instance, the first wave, are we saving fuel by not running the engines while it's on the ground? In the second stage, the ambition here will be to have no driver at all involved in, in, uh, in pulling the airplane all the way to the threshold of the runway, where you can then start the engines, heat them up for a few seconds and take off. Uh, significant fuel savings associated with this. Now, there are, there's a lot of buzz out there, noise out there in the industry about uh, uh, electrical taxiing, etc. There's, there's an other approach to this, which we're also investigating, and the two are not mutually exclusive. It's uh, the electrical taxiing, uh, or e-taxi, as some call it, etc., which is effectively electrical motors on, installed on the landing gear of the airplanes. That is also a solution we are uh, we believe in and we, uh, we're investigating. Both are not mutually exclusive. Why? Simply because this, the, the taxi boat, the tractor, is quite suitable for very heavy aircraft, for large aircraft. Large aircraft are, are just too heavy for electrical motors to propel them on the ground. Lighter aircraft, single-aisle aircraft, 320s for example, couldn't do, could do with uh, electrical motors installed on the landing gear, particularly if they fly to remote airports that may not be equipped with uh, the taxi boat. So the two solutions are actually complementary and, and not mutually exclusive. So those would be uh, three examples uh, of, uh, of the kind of applications that, uh, that uh, come out of uh, Harry Potter's <coughs> laboratory, uh, Stefan. Uh, somewhat esoteric, apologize for that. My team thought, because I'm probably going to butcher the explanation of these, they've put together a little video that's going to uh, repeat and show you visually uh, what we're talking about for these three uh, applications.
nurses are very, uh, very proud of their little babies. But they, uh, we, 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 we do have high hopes uh, invested in this. I, the last thing I would say to illustrate um, uh, what we're trying to do, we have a very lean uh, governance of these kind of new business initiatives, uh, a very agile way of making decisions, uh, releasing uh, some investment money to develop these things. Uh, so we can be a very large industrial company and still be very quick on our feet when it comes to developing new applications. As we see, we move very much into the digital age. Now, when we talk about digital type products, there is a, a huge area out there called, uh, well, we call it ATM, air traffic management, etc. And that air traffic management in itself is a, is a nuance uh, uh, when uh, we compare it to the traditional denomination of air traffic control. Air traffic control uh, is an antiquated way of directing traffic uh, uh, through the air. It still relies, like it did in 1930, on, on high frequency radios uh, to tell the pilot to stop at the red light or turn left or uh, uh, move slower or, or uh, take this particular track, etc. Um, you know, suffice it to say that. Uh, compared with today's situation, if we had a perfectly optimized way of regulating traffic, of sequencing air traffic through uh, the air, this industry would save close to 10% of its fuel burn, 9% to be exact. So you can, you, you can imagine, I mean people kill for 2% of fuel burn in this industry, so 9% of fuel burn is a very low hanging fruit when you think that today in the digital age we should, albeit uh, in a very complex environment, but we should have the technology uh, to be able to optimize the flow of airplanes across the air, particularly in congested areas. So the world, the aviation world, has undertaken a massive reform of its air traffic control system and we believe as, as, the, uh, as this particular sector of our industry moves from a a fairly conventional, analog, paper and radio driven type of operation to a digital type of operation, there is a place for a company like ours who happen to be the masters of the technology that's on the airplane. There is a place for a company like ours to move into this business, not only for the fundamental reason, which is to allow sustainable growth for our industry by decongesting the airports and gateways and, and airways around the world, but also perhaps as a business opportunity. Um, here's some, uh, some facts and figures uh, still on, on, on ATM. This is not Airbus saying it or Boeing or, or any of the OEMs that may be interested in selling kit into the new uh, ATM system. Uh, this is an independent study done by, by Deloitte, which today is kind of a, the, the reference study in the ATM world. Uh, if, if you had a fully optimized ATM system, you would save 4 million hours of, of transportation delay. Now those are airplane hours. If you assume that the average airplane carries, I don't know, 150 passengers, multiply that number, 4 million, by uh, 150, and you can see the number of wasted hours at the individual level around the world because of air traffic delays. Air traffic delays make airplanes fly longer. If airplanes fly longer, particularly accelerating, decelerating, uh, holding, climbing, descending, etc., well, you fly longer, your maintenance cost goes up. It's not negligible. Think about it, 9% of fuel burn equates, I don't know, not quite 9% in extra time, but the more you fly, the more you consume spare parts, etc., etc. Your maintenance cost is significantly decreased if you have an optimized air traffic management system. Uh, not to mention the emission of CO2. You can see nearly 30 million metric tons of CO2 could be saved, equivalent to 3 billion gallons of fuel saved yearly. Now, all in all, Deloitte have done a very comprehensive uh, study uh, showing, in particular, the legislator who is going to have to take action in this, that going to an optimized ATM system would net economically about $135 billion every year 
in 2026, assuming that in 2026 we have a fully rolled out new ATM system. Improving our air traffic control or our air traffic management system is a necessity for our industry to allow it to grow at the rate it wants to grow around the world, which is, I remind you, as per Airbus's GM, 4.8% on average every year of the next 20 years. That 4.8% is based on an unconstrained environment. If we face a constraint due to air traffic congestion, we are somewhat compromising, although there are other escape valves, but we are somewhat compromising the potential growth of this industry. So we need to pull together and, uh, and precipitate, help catalyze the arrival of the new ATM system. Now Airbus has anticipated this and a few years ago we <coughs> created a specific entity that is dealing with this particular issue. Driven not so much initially by, uh, let me say, commercial considerations, but really by this necessity to educate the world around us that we need a new ATM system. Airbus has created a company called Airbus ProSky, uh, which has been selected by the European Union, which has a new ATM ambition headed uh, under the heading of CESAR. The Americans one is called NextGen, as you know. CESAR, the European uh, Commission, has selected Airbus to be, uh, let's call it in layman's terms, the the industrial architect for the new ATM system. So Airbus ProSky is today in a very strong position uh, to advise, to consult for and advise the legislator on the attributes of the new ATM system. Now since then, because it is such an important, um, an important item for our future, and because it represents an opportunity by moving, as I said, from the old age to the digital age, the established players are going to have to invest just as much as a new player would to be able to enter this type of business. We have equipped ourselves with a number of tools in a toolbox that allow us to offer solutions to whether it's ANSPs, the air navigation service providers, or whether it's airports or airlines, of course. Typically, the airlines would mandate, that it's in their interest as well that the legislator moves forward in introducing better technologies. And so the airlines are mandating it, and we are offering solutions, not just consulting solutions, but now through the various acquisitions that we've done or developments that we've made ourselves, uh, we're offering solutions to optimize and move towards the new ATM system. You can see, uh, some of the uh, uh, trade names that we have uh, acquired or developed, Quovadis is a development, uh, an organic development inside of Airbus. Metron is probably one of the most um, gutsy moves that we've made recently. We've acquired a US-based US engineering and software development firm called Metron Aviation sitting in Washington and a, and a provider of services in particular to the FAA and Atrix, which is a, a German-based uh, uh, ATM company uh, focusing on surface management. Um, so there are really three areas of activities uh, that emerge out of the, uh, the ATM world. One is this consulting role that I've described, in which we, we have a very strong position already, uh, being the, uh, uh, let's call it the air architect of uh, the CESA system. The second one is providing data, is collecting digital data and providing data to those who will use it to run the ATM system. And the third one is actually to develop procedures and, and, and perhaps even go so far as to maintain or run some of the applications to effectively do air traffic management. So consulting, design, data supply. Data supply, for example, could be uh, uh, digital, uh, uh, digital information on weather, digital information on navigation points, etc., etc. Uh, not no longer charts, no longer paper charts. You know, but digital navigation information, and and of course then the software development and operational handling of the tools that will run uh, air traffic management. So, with the suite of tools that we have already developed and or acquired, 
Airbus is now in a position, or Airbus ProSky is now in a position to offer services uh, and sequencing, effectively mainly sequencing services uh, to, uh, from the airport through the air traffic flow, essentially metro aviation, back to the airport on precision navigation, precision procedures for landing through poor bodies. A little bit more in detail, metro aviation that I mentioned is this, this US-based uh, uh, software development firm. They have a commercial product called Harmony, which is already operated uh, by a number of large airlines. Uh, FedEx comes to mind, uh, but also large airports around around the world. It is uh, it is the the optimized sequencing, if you like, of aircraft in the airspace around major airports. But it is also it also has a design bureau capability of designing of designing software and designing operational procedures and advising DFA or other regulators on the design criteria for the ATM system of the future. We're very, very proud of this particular acquisition uh, in, uh, in Airbus ProSky. Kovadis, the organically developed solution uh, uh, for radio, for uh, required precision uh, approaches, uh, that's a, a, a company developed internally uh, by Airbus. It provides advice and, and procedural solutions to airports and or airlines around the world to allow it instead of uh, you know, the, the, uh, the rather cumbersome uh, alignment uh, to the runway miles uh, before the threshold. It allows very precise and, and short precision approaches into airports, therefore saving significant fuel. Uh, that requires a deep knowledge of the aircraft involved, it requires the deep knowledge of the terrain, of the various considerations around the airport. Uh, we've secured a number of contracts uh, uh, with Kuovadis already. In fact, uh, we may be announcing one in, uh, I think I've put it here in Abu Dhabi, uh, very, very shortly. Uh, and, and it's a very promising new business in which I dare say we are definitely the market leader today. And then uh, finally, I mentioned Atrix. Atrix is a company uh, that we've now integrated in our product offering at Airbus ProSky that sequences, that optimizes the sequencing on the ground at the airport of aircraft. The, the organization, the optimized organization of aircraft that line up for departure or for landing. So we've got the whole cycle covered from airport handling through the air, airflow optimization <coughs> and precision landing approaches. We've got the whole, the whole uh, circle uh, done in the product suite of Airbus ProSky. That's enough on the um, on the service development, happy to answer questions uh, later on that. I just wanted to throw in a couple of examples, in particular on the ATM world, uh, to, uh, to illustrate what we're doing. Maybe before I leave that, on the ATM world, I, I wanted to give you an order of magnitude. The order of magnitude of the effective business that a company that handles air transportation uh, management development and operational support, like data support, or um, uh, or even software development, the ambition is in excess of a billion, of a billion dollars per year. I just want to leave that order of magnitude with you. So, we talked about product, we talked about service development in the, in the digital age. Um, there is a, a, a last uh, dimension in, in our strategic thinking uh, that I should not omit, although, uh, of course, it's sensitive, it's called internationalization. Uh, I don't know if you've already seen this picture, but this is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the breakdown, the geographical breakdown of the foreseen demand for aircraft in the next 20 years. Uh, what's pretty obvious, I think uh, Tom Anders mentioned it last night, is that the bulk of the demand is going to come out of Asia. Nearly 10,000 aircraft will be required in Asia in the next 20 years. And you can see the two, let's call them more mature geopolitical areas. Europe and North America, each sitting there with 6,000 airplanes. So it's pretty obvious, you can see three continents and, and three really strong geopolitical pull for demand of aircraft. Note Latin America as well, 2,000 airplanes required in Latin America. Who would have thought that 10 years ago? So as a consequence, if you want to be a global business, you need to be globally present. Airbus is and has the ambition of being a global 
company, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on that. I believe uh, Airbus has a unique ability amongst all of the aircraft OEMs to indeed be the only one that is truly global by nature. Remember I said our new competitors are all nationally driven programs. Boeing is very much a nationally driven organization because more than half of their profits and revenues uh, come from Uncle Sam, so Boeing is very much impregnated with the interest of Uncle Sam and therefore is very much a US-centric type of company. We have the ambition to be a global company and what we've done over the last few years, we've accept, expanded around the world, whether it's in, with manufacturing sites, you know, we have a, a manufacturing sites, not just final assembly, uh, which are highly symbolic, but also sort of tier one manufacturing sites around the world. We have various support offices around the world, subsidiaries everywhere around the world. And even though you may see in America here on the left a relative absence, industrially speaking, uh, we are procuring in excess of $11 billion of material equipment out of America every year. So from a procurement point of view, we're extremely present in America as well. So I'll end on that. Airbus has the ambition and is a global business and will continue to expand around the world. Thank you.